On those hot Jurassic nights, how did the dinosaurs make the Earth move? For millions of years, their sex lives have remained a primordial puzzle. Now science is giving us a tantalizing look at how these creatures courted, mated, and cared for their young. It's time we had a frank talk about dinosaur sex. For 65 million years, the love lives of the dinosaurs have been a dark mystery. Probably the least researched and most misunderstood part of dinosaur behavior is sex. Mere bones tell us little about acts of the flesh. Paleontologists such as Bob Baca are piecing together a complete picture of dinosaurs as creatures that pursued life with a passion. We're looking at their horns, we're looking at their hooters, the noisemakers in their snouts. Dinosaurs were as invested in sex as a bighorn sheep or a moose, because without sex, don't get your genes into the next generation. If you don't do that, you're a Darwinian zero. To pass on your genes, you first have to attract a mate. And the dinosaurs developed an array of sexual lures. Bright colors, elaborate displays, and come hither gestures. You got to advertise. The dinosaur world evolved very fast. Fast evolving animals advertise a lot. So there would be sonic advertisement, there would be visual advertisement, it would be in color, it would be in dance, it would be a full uh, Broadway musical of courtship display. Such behavior was overlooked by early paleontologists. Here's a gallery of some of the great dino thinkers of this country. Professor Marsh of Yale, he found Triceratops. Professor Osborne, he found T-Rex. Dr. Barnum Brown dug dinosaurs all over the world. S.W. Williston ran the department at Chicago. Now these guys thought about attack, predators and prey. They thought about chewing, how a, a horse or a brontosaur would chew plants. They thought about locomotion. They thought about climbing mountains and digging holes, but they didn't think about sex. It was verboten nearly totally. Early paleontologists barely scratched the surface of dinosaur behavior. To them, the extravagant array of dinosaur horns was used strictly for attack or defense. These sex-free dino thinkers weren't letting dinosaurs be real, living, breathing animals. Here's a real, living, breathing animal. It's a bighorn sheep. It's a complete animal. It eats plants, it runs away from predators, but it's also thinking about courtship, about sex. It's literally got sex on the brain. These horns, which dominate the skull architecture, are for ramming other bighorn sheep during courtship contests. And what the dino thinkers didn't let dinosaurs do is grow things for sex. Dinosaurs, like modern bighorn sheep, developed headgear for the same reasons to intimidate rivals and impress a mate. Mighty T-Rex, it seems, also had sex on the brain. Bony ridges on top of the skull were well suited for battling rivals head to head over a potential mate. If you have great genes, if you're a Tyrannosaurus Rex and, and your genes are the best possible for running and killing prey, it's still no use at all if you can't get those genes out there and mix them with the genes of another T-Rex of the opposite sex and make little Rexlets in the next generation. T-Rex has 
sort of a bony football helmet behind the eye as a cushion for the eye and the brain along the snout to these raised roughened edges that in life would be covered with very tough skin. Of course that's for whacking. To imagine two T-Rexes whacking heads with each other in sexual combat, just watch these woolly bison go at it. Now picture the same scene replayed with creatures who weighed up to eight tons. The Pachycephalosaurus too seemed to have a head for sex. It towered 10 feet above the ground and likely used its enormous 10 inch thick brain case to batter sexual rivals. The domed head would identify it to the opposite sex as a strong mate. The crowning touch in sexual headgear belongs to the breed of dinosaurs known as the Ceratopsians, especially the most famous of them, Triceratops, named for its three horns. When paleontologists found Triceratops in the same layers of earth as T. rex, they assumed the frills and horns were defensive structures. But as other Ceratopsians came to light, their elaborate headgear was not so easily explained. They were too widely varied to be used simply for defense, too fragile for anything, attack, defense, or sexual headbutting. To learn why the dinosaurs had such elaborate headgear, paleontologists looked to modern animals. Antelopes developed many sizes and shapes of horns, but not for attack or defense. The horns signal their sexual maturity to mates and intimidate would-be rivals. Ceratopsian dinosaurs like Pachyrhinoceros developed different headgear at different stages. Paleontologist Darren Tankey of the Royal Tyrrell Museum of Alberta, Canada studies Pachyrhinoceros fossils for clues to the animal's age and sex. What we have here are three casts of reconstructed skulls of Pachyrhinosaurus. This one which we believe to be a female, this a male, and this a juvenile. The frill on the juveniles and young adults have this simple pie crust edge type effect. And in the adults we have some very large horns developing on the back of the frill. These do not develop until the animal reaches full adult size and presumed sexual maturity. And Previously, it was believed these horns were for protection only. I think it's now fairly clear that this is Mother Nature's way of saying that A, I'm a male or female Pachyrhinosaurus, and B, I am of breeding age. The sex of the Pachyrhinosaurus is anyone's guess until it reaches adulthood and develops headgear. Paleontologists believe the adult female's horns are less ornate than the longer and more pronounced horns of the full-grown male. Those dinosaurs without elaborate headgear, like the giant brontosaurs, may have advertised their intentions with color, turning themselves into walking billboards for sex. Baca thinks the largest dinosaurs, unlike large land animals today, were quite colorful. The reason big animals today are gray is because they are color blind. They don't see in colors. They're big mammals. Big mammals are color blind, but birds see color. Well, alligators and crocodiles see color too, so do lizards. You see a panoply of bright colors in fish and frogs. Did dinosaurs see color? Their eyes were built like birds, mostly, a little bit like crocs, and they must have seen a full range of reds and yellows and blues. So, of course, a bull brontosaurus would have some iridescent blue around its eye, maybe a ring of yellow and red around its throat to advertise itself. The most elaborate assortment of crests and colors belonged to the duck-billed dinosaurs, like Critosaurus, whose classic profile earned it the name Noble Lizard. Its cousin, Sorolophus, used a two-foot head spike to get itself noticed. The fan-shaped hollow crest of the Lambiosaurus surely made it stand out in a crowd. But the most prominent of the duck-billed dinosaur crests was that of the Parasaurolophus. Of all the extravagant sexual displays, this was the most baffling. Weighing up to four tons, the mighty vegetarian was endowed 
with a six-foot hollow crest. This majestic headgear mystified David White Semple, a paleontologist from Johns Hopkins University. The crest itself is very, very fragile. It's built out of very thin bone. Probably couldn't withstand a lot of this head-to-head -head stuff like you see in bighorn sheep. Because many Parasaurolophus fossils had been found in marine sediment, many paleontologists suggested the horn was used as a snorkel when the giant beast went swimming. But a Swedish paleontologist named Carl Wieman solved the mystery. Carl Wieman in Uppsala got himself a duckbill dinosaur with a hollow crest. He looked at it and said, it looks like a trombone. It was a trombone. It was for making loud courtship noises. David Weishempel wondered what the 70 million year old love song of the Parasaurolophus sounded like. He knew that when the animal exhaled, the air would shoot up the windpipe to the back of the crest into the throat and out the snout. Weishempel built himself a horn as long as the crest and taught himself to play it. Well, this contraption that I've got in my hands here is, in fact, a model of the crest of Parasaurolophus. It's the right size and the right shape for Parasaurolophus. It's built out of PVC tubing. And the reason I built it was to get a better sense as to the kinds of sound that Parasaurolophus would have made. So why don't I play it for you? This unique love song no doubt made the Parasaurolophus the diva of the dinosaurs. Using the trombones in their heads, they serenaded mates and repelled rivals. After all the singing, stomping, and headbutting was over, the dinosaurs finally got down to some real romance. Just how they did it, the fossils don't say. But some scientists have reached their own conclusions. The late Beverly Halstead, a British professor of geology and zoology, was noted for his candid theories of dinosaur sex. Is to discuss one or two aspects he speculated of the... that the male mounted the female from the rear, twisting the tail under hers to align the sex organs. The male would have to keep one foot on the ground to avoid crushing the female during mating. Halstead not only published his theories, he famously demonstrated them in his lectures. That we're interested in is about there. That is the critical part. So if we take up the same position again, down of it like this, imagine now that I have a tail coming here, and my hand is doing, I can actually get under, twist my tail, she can twist her tail, and we can get two cloaca into direct, correct position. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> This precarious three-point stance seems to work for most dinosaurs. But consider the Stegosaurus. It literally points out the problem with Halstead's theory. How the male Stegosaurus felt the next morning, no one can say. By all accounts, the impressive size of the dinosaurs was not matched by the size of their sex organs. Like modern reptiles, male dinosaurs had no true penis. The sex organ, called the cloaca, is set back beneath the tail as it is in birds and lizards. Some male dinosaurs had a specialized bone at the base of the tail to maneuver the cloaca into position. The chevron bone of the mighty male T. rex, for example, is a mere eight to 10 inches long. And Halstead claimed that the sex organ of a four-story, 70-foot-long brontosaur would have been, at best, a mere foot and a half in length. Darren Tankey believes that he had found proof that dinosaur sex was not only awkward, but hazardous. Literally hundreds of broken and re-heeled spines on the tails of the duck-billed dinosaurs. You can see large bony growths and when you look at it and on you can see that the neural spine this process right here has been bent and twisted and from looking at it I can see at least two or three different fracture sites that have 
mended, they've been rehealed. Some scientists have proposed an obvious solution. Duckbills were social animals, getting in each other's way and stepping on tails, except that the breaks were more common at the base of the tail, not the tip. Now, when you look at these, you can actually try to uh, and begin to establish how they may have been formed. And it looks like a great weight has pressed down on them from above. It's either that or the animal's laying on its back and collapsing under its own weight. But I, I cannot see any reason why an animal would be doing that. Paleontologist Lou Jacobs has conducted extensive digs in Texas. He considers Tanky's theory improbable. Uh, I don't think that makes too much sense uh, because, uh, uh, you know, the, the point of uh, sexual uh, reproduction is to have offspring. And uh, there needs to be some sort of element of pleasure in it. And I don't think breaking your tail is a particularly pr pleasurable thing or adaptive. And I doubt that it happened too much, if at all. Even if sex for the dinosaurs wasn't much fun, it clearly worked. So what were the dinosaurs like as parents? Until recently, paleontologists assumed they were like many modern reptiles. They laid their eggs and moved on. But now tiny bones of baby dinosaurs are emerging and casting their parents in a different light. more about the sexual habits of dinosaurs, our picture of them is changing. Jack Horner of the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana, has done a lot to bring that about. Horner is a fossil hunter's Indiana Jones. He has found more dinosaur bones than anyone, but he has never found the fossils of an infant dinosaur. One day, quite by chance, Horner stopped at a rock shop near Shoto in northern Montana. In the nearby Badlands, the owner had found tiny bones she could not identify. She asked Horner to take a look. Horner realized he had stumbled onto the very thing he had been looking for. The bones of dinosaur young. With a team of graduate students, Horner immediately began excavating the site where the bones had been discovered. What they found was not just baby fossils, but an entire nesting ground and scores of fossilized dinosaur eggs clustered together. The site would become known as Egg Mountain, and it was here that Horner would change forever the image of dinosaurs as monsters. These dinosaurs had cared for their young. Finding dinosaur eggs and dinosaur babies changed the way people looked at dinosaurs because people had always looked at dinosaurs, well, they'd looked at dinosaurs two ways. They'd looked at them as, as large adults, and they'd looked at them as skeletons. And I mean, our museums portray dinosaurs just as skeletons. Sort of dead things stood up. And the baby dinosaurs, the eggs, finally brought life to them. Now we have a sense of the complete dinosaur from hatchling to mature, sexually active adult to old grandmother. The love lives of the dinosaurs have given us our first complete picture of these fantastic creatures. They flirted and they fought. They tooted their horns. And they flaunted their sexuality with colorful abandon. From the buried secrets of dinosaur sex has come a new awareness that the swamps and forests where they lived were not only places of terror, they were places of primordial passion.